So over to you, Sandy. Okay, well, let's just take a few moments and uh, we'll just start with a moment of prayer. God, we gather before you in difficult times. We gather in times of division. We open our hearts to you in prayer. We pray for the people of Ukraine. We pray for their turmoil, their struggles, this moment of tragedy and crisis. We pray that we will hear their cries and do what we can. We pray for the people of Russia struggling to make sense of what's going on. We pray for the folly of leaders fearful of the future who try to change what they cannot no longer understand. When we talk of leadership, oh God, open our hearts to your vision of leadership, which is to serve. Amen. Well, I shall start with a few moments of introduction um, of what the plan is. Um, our big conversation next week will be a question of division and how do we talk and whatever. Um, and so we decided that the focus should be uh, a bit of a lecture um, on what Paul uh, talks about division and leadership. In the, and I've decided to focus on the, his first letter to the Corinthians, um, because in many ways, there's a variety of issues in that letter that I feel might give us some insights to the question of what does leadership look like for us? What does it mean to deal with division within the community? And you know, issues that on the surface seem a little ridiculous with um, some patience, some insight, and some uh, willingness to listen can illustrate something more deeper, uh, something more kind of um, Nothing else going on. Like we often like, I'll, I'll just use an example, like kind of a bit of a a cliche in modern church conversations often revolves around pews. And this can lead to major divisions within congregations when congregations start asking questions: should we move the pews or not? And you know, do we need pews in the church and all this kind of stuff? And you know, on the surface, it seems ridiculous. Like, why would it make much of a difference? Why would it cause so much palaver? Like, why would there be strong meetings with lots of, you and my grandfather said, and blah, 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 blah. On the surface, it looks faintly ridiculous to anyone outside. But the reality is, often there's deeper issues at stake. Um, the removal of the pew may seem an attack against something that's familiar, something that people have grown up with. It, it's, it becomes symbolic. It becomes important because they feel that their voices are no longer being heard. They haven't been acknowledged. And the pain they may suffer from that loss of memories of the past, kind of the good old days or whatever. And it may seem problematic. It may seem a challenge. But I think in many ways, um, what I hope to show that through the work of Paul, that um, we have that sense of division that does exist. And, and I think this is a critical issue that you know, I will, it's one of the things I always struggle with. We have to acknowledge the reality of division. Um, it exists in all communities and exists in all places where people gather together because of people. We have a tendency to try and ignore division or belittle it, uh, make it less important than it needs to be. And if we hope, if we ignore it, I think that's another kind of common human trait. If we ignore the division, it'll go away. That doesn't work. I cannot think of a time in human history when <laughs> we've ignored the division and it went away. Um, what often happens instead is it builds, it festers, it, it goes in different directions. And when, if the division had been dealt with in a healthy manner, and sometimes division is useful. Um, I'm a product of the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, a profound period of division within the church. 
in some ways it was a catastrophe, in some ways it might even be a tragedy, but in other ways it was a profound renewal of the faith tradition, a new direction, a new awareness, um, a new time of growth. How we deal with division, how does leadership work within that? It has the potential to be catastrophic. We make the wrong mistakes, we listen to the wrong people, things become worse, or it has the opportunity for a renewal, for a regrowth, an opportunity to see things in a new light. So that's the kind of the overall arc as it were. And as I said, um, in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, the key issue for it, the whole letter is the question of division and leadership. What does leadership look like in this community of Paul, of Corinth? Uh, and, you know, and, it's, and I'll, I'll, we'll start off by reading the, the, the passage from the beginning. It's, uh, this is from the opening from the first chapter of Paul's letter to the first letter to the Corinthians. Um, this is from chap, uh, chapter one, and we'll start from verse 10. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and there'll be no division among you, but that you'll be united in the same mind and same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So there you are from the very beginning. A couple of, kind of technical details. Uh, Apollos is believed to have been the leader of the community that, of Corinth, who took over when, when Paul left. Paul had been in Corinth probably for about a year and a half. He'd helped to establish the church. He'd helped to establish, teach them and such and such. And after a year and a half, he had left to go on to form other congregations. Um, what we have with Paul's letter is the response to the initial concern. And in this case, um, it is important to be my Chloe's people. Now, just, you know, because I like to kind of throw out interesting facts. Uh, the one thing I point out that is interesting is Chloe's people. Chloe is a woman. Chloe is a woman. And so what we can gather from here, Chloe is a woman who has some understanding of being a position of an authority in this congregation, in that she feels that she has the right to get in touch with Paul to bring him up to speed with what's going on in the congregation of Corinth. And for a woman to have that kind of position of authority, that position within a social group in these days is very significant. And one is one of those facts that makes it more awkward when you try to paint Paul as a misogynist. So Chloe's people, now, who are Chloe's people? Is it you know some slaves that she sent or delegation? We don't know. But what we do know is that, there, that um, Paul has been made aware of the divisions. And in the next verse, when he talks about, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas, Kephas is the Greek uh, term that we, you also use for Simon and Peter. So it's, it's Peter, as in Peter, the apostle of Jesus. Um, the background there is that there were tensions between the leadership of Paul and the leadership of Kephas, Paul and Peter. And so there may well be some within the Corinthian community who had enough of Paul and didn't like what he was doing and have now attached themselves to Kephas, who was probably one of the established leaders of the world. So, and then you've got, I belong to Christ and whatever. People who are saying they're above all kind of human authority. So from the beginning of the letter, Paul is saying, here are the signs of division. So where does Paul, you know, where does Paul's authority come from? You know, what gives him the right to say, I've got this letter from Chloe's people. 
I'm going to go lay down the law. Well, he helped to form the community. You know, he was one of the founders. And so I, that gives him authority. Also, because of his position, as he will make reference to in, in the letter, as someone who has seen the resurrected Christ. And his overall authority as the Gentile, as the apostle to the Gentiles. But I think there's also another more practical um, way of looking at it. And that is, he is a step away. He is no longer in the middle of the conflicts and whatever that are happening within congregations. He is now working in another church. Uh, it, it, it would be like, I don't know, just as an example myself, I might get a letter from um, uh, someone in my previous church and they might say, we are having a problem here and can you give us some insights? And I might be able to give some insights because I'm removed from the situation. I you know, have different objectives. And I think what Paul is doing is he can see a larger picture of why these divisions have occurred. And at the same time, remind this congregation of the consequences of these divisions, offer insights to why they may have happened, and then offer a path to restore the relationship between members of the congregation. This is not a healthy community. The community in Corinth is a community that is struggling to be faithful. And part of that struggle is leadership. What kind of leadership is being offered by the new group that are established themselves? As, is this leadership willing to hear Paul? You know, like with many teams, we don't know what happens next. You know, we don't know. That if they got the letter from Paul, they read out the letter and everyone said, oh, thank you, Paul, back on track. Or who the heck does he think he is? You know, he's away now. This is no longer his problem. You know, he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know what Apollos has to deal with. And he doesn't know what Cephas has to offer. He's away off in Galatia and Ephesus having a way all the time. And then he comes back and tells us what to do. Ah, who, who the heck is he? Part of the context is, also, is the question of what world are these people living in? What does leadership look like in the world of Paul and Corinth? And what does the vision in a community look like then? In many of these communities, uh, power was hierarchical, male centered, uh, male focused and often a reflection of status, wealth, and power. Sometimes it could also be reflected in a sense of an awareness of gifts. What kind of gifts for leadership do I have? Or what kind, or probably more importantly, what kind of gifts do I think I have? Because one of the realities of human leadership is some people think there are way more blessed with gifts of leadership than there really are but I have somehow ended up in a position of leadership. And we could rattle up all the examples and the kingdom come. How much of the divisions within the community of Corinth are a consequence of the tensions between the hope of the kingdom of God and the reality of the world, of the Roman Hellenistic world of Corinth? This is a world where leaders expect to be treated as people of authority with the mindset that they are in due deference from the people around them. That if you're in a position of leadership, you do it for the good of the community, but you also do it in a way that the community will celebrate your leadership, that they'll celebrate what you bring to the table. Um, many cities of the, of, the, of the Roman world and Corinth would certainly no, uh, be no stranger to this. You would often see statues statues in honor of various rich people who had done something, who had shown quote unquote leadership in a time of crisis, who'd handed over a large amount of money, who had provided wisdom or guidance or whatever, 
And after that event had been given a statue and a pat on the head and said, you're off. And this is a common fact. And so for many, and so for the insert and the emerging leaders in Corinth, there would be those who would have that same mindset that they would say to themselves, I am a leader. I have been blessed with gifts from God. I have the gift of healing, the gift of preaching, the gift of discerning. I should be in a position of authority and recognized as such. And this is something that will happen later. This is something that we'll see in the so-called pastoral letters written to Titus and Timothy, where that is what does happen. You know, religious leaders are put in positions of deference, they're put in positions of authority. They're established as leaders in the way that the world around them would recognize. But that's not the way of the kingdom of God. One of the critical themes of First Corinthians is Paul reminding his audience of how Paul of of how God acts to challenge our expectations of the world. And once more, we, I'll, I'll read straight from the first card. Corinthians, the first card. Chapter, um, chapter one from verse 26. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in this world to shame the wise. God chose what was weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. God is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that, as it is written, that the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. In other words, to put it simply, everything's changed. To be a leader in the community of Christ is to reject the standards of leadership in the world around you, because you are serving a vision of God incarnate in the world that challenged all the expectations. The expectation that Jesus, that the Messiah, would come as a lowly laborer and then be crucified, that was just utterly bizarre. In fact, it was, you know, it was probably one of the reasons why Paul himself initially was an, an opponent for the way of Christians, because for many observant Jews of the day, their vision of the Messiah was absolutely abhorrent. The idea that the Messiah would die a horrible death, that was just, that was not what their expectations were. And so here you have these Christians proclaiming the crucified Christ in a world that both Gentile and Jew would say, that's not on. You know, the reason the Roman crucifies you is to show you that you are with no value. It is a sign of state terrorism to say to the world, this life is worthless. We'll show you how worthless it is. We'll nail it to a tree so you can gawk at it and be reminded this is what happens to any other worthless individual who dares to mess with Rome. The very idea that God would become that for many was just, it was, you know, incomprehensible and in many ways you'll see how this is you know how christians wrestle with this like the the way they talk about the crucifixion the way they talk about the resurrection the the roughness of like you know the vision of mark um becomes it's interesting because i was i was talking about this last night with jen oh we had a religious conversation and she was working for one of our tv for her podcast in the x files and i was talking about how the, 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 the kind of approach changes, that it becomes less and less shocking 
the way that Jesus is portrayed in the crucifixion process becomes more and more like he's more like a noble leader, more like a warrior. He, he's more in charge of the process, where in the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, he is not in charge. He is fearful. He is frightened. He doesn't want this to happen. So there's that ongoing tension. How do you, you know, the, the folly of the world. And Paul, from the very beginning, is saying, we are part of something different. This is the Messiah, not of our expectations, but the Messiah this world needs. A Messiah who shows the humility of God because God wants to reach down to us to be in relationship with us. That instead of overwhelming us with great power and majesty, God will challenge our expectations of what power and majesty look like. So we'll move on to a, a specific example of leadership in a community. Chapter eight, uh, one of my greatest challenges when it comes to Pauline theology. Now, considering food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs us up, but loves build. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but someone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is only one God, the Father, from whom all are all things and for whom exist, and for one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things through whom exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause for their failing, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. So what's going on here? Leadership. Leadership of the kingdom of God, as opposed to leadership of the world. The, you know, I think I mentioned before, but I'm oh, very quick. Meat, most meat in the cities of the, of the Hellenistic world came from temples. But when animals were sacrificed to the gods, and this is also true in uh, temple Judaism at the same time as well, the gods didn't get much. They, they got, the, they got the smoke wafting up, the smell, the aroma of the burning meat. They got some innards and whatever, but the meat itself was sold by the temples and then was you know, handed over to butchers and whatever. That's kind of the main source of meat. Meat was not something that was eaten much of. Most protein in the world came from beans, from legumes, uh, cheese, and other dairy products. Meat was a bit of a treat. It was a barbecue, you know, like um, maybe one of the best ways of looking at it. But it was, it was dedicated to a pagan god. So if you were in Corinth and you wanted meat, it was probably dedicated to one of the Greek gods of the city. So it would be Apollo, Aphrodite, or maybe a, a ruler cult or whatever. It doesn't make any sense. Now, what we hear in this letter is that there are some who now say, and, and, and I was going to say in the past, in the past for Jews uh, to eat this meat would be a defilement. The only meat they could 
eat with either meat that they had bought from the temple or meat that they had you know, harvested themselves or whatever that had not been in any way involved with any religious uh, rites. In a city, the only place you get meat from is the temple. So anyone in the Corinthian community would have to get their meat from these pagan temples. And as Paul says, in the past, as a pagan, you would eat this meat, no problem. If you were a Jew eating this meat, big problem. Um, and now in this new community, some are saying we can eat the meat. Because it's, it's not problematic anymore. Because Not that the, the rituals have changed. It's just that the rituals are meaningless. The gods don't exist. So if you dedicate meat to a non-existent god, we can chow down. You know, get out the stakes. But as Paul says, what happens when the people who don't understand what's going on eat this meat that is, they believe is dedicated to a pagan god? Now, they still think it's dedicated to a pagan god, but they'll eat the meat because they think it's okay. And what Paul is saying, because of their limited understanding of what's going on, they are putting themselves at risk because even though the meat is not really a sense of defilement, it's what they think is going on. And so they think it's okay to eat meat even though it's dedicated to a pagan god because the smart, the smart ones up there know they're doing it, so it's okay. What Paul says, okay, you're smart. He says to the ones who are eating meat. He says, you know this stuff is okay. But since you're in a position of having more knowledge, more wisdom, a position of leadership within this community, you should act like a leader. And part of that role is not so much to tell people it's okay, we can now all chomp down together but to stop eating meat, to acknowledge their struggles to understand, to be aware that they are struggling to understand what it means to eat meat, what it means not to eat meat. They're not sure, they think they might be okay, but they're still not coming, you know, like there's a whole bunch of stuff. To make it simple for everyone is to say, okay, we are not eating meat dedicated to pagan gods. So how do you show leadership? You show leadership of concern, pastoral leadership. This is a leadership that says to members of your community, we understand your struggles. We're willing to work with you to help you understand in the long term why it's okay to eat meat. But until then, we will share your challenges, your struggles, and we will avoid eating the meat. It's what it means to be part of a community of faith, a willingness to sacrifice your own sense of smartness. Um, it's actually, it's, a, it's an interesting example of the difference between intelligence and wisdom. Intelligently, you know the meat's okay, but with wisdom to serve the needs of the community, you say, I will not eat the meat until they have reached the same level. So it's like, a, it's like one of these divisions caused in the community by some people being, thinking they're smarter than others. And at the end of the day, you know, as I said, it's, yeah, it may well be a sign of intelligence, but it's not really much of a sign of wisdom to just kind of plow ahead and think all, because this is an ongoing theme. There's other examples of this. There's some, you know, some even much more racier examples in this letter. Like apparently some people were deciding that, you know, you know, all the old rules were about, you know, proper sexual behavior were all, you know, all up for grabs, you know, like you could get, get up to all kinds of shenanigans. You know, this is kind of one of the more tamer ones. And then there's the question of communion. And, you know, we'll be celebrating communion this week. Communion is supposed to be a sign of the hope of the kingdom of God. It's supposed to be a sign of unity all gather around the table to share 
in this meal that is a glimpse of the kingdom. Instead, as we hear, it's a sign of, you know, division. Here, as Paul says in chapter 11, verses 17. Now, in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear that the divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. Indeed, there have to be factions among you, for only so will it become clear that among you who are genuine. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper. and One goes hungry with another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show your contempt the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What would I say to you? Should I commend you? In this manner, I do not commend you. What's going on? Well, social eating in the Hellenistic world in many ways reflected the power structures of the world. You ate with your peers. And if you didn't, you know, you would be served by the enslaved people and they would be hanging back and they would be you know, waiting to do whatever was necessary. But in particular in the Greek world, it was a social occasion where you ate with your peers and you, you know, there were various entertainments and there were and uh, food, and, and there was a lot of posturing going on. One of the things that was often happening was like showing off about how wealthy you were by bringing in exotic types of food, meat, you know, different kinds of meat. In the Greek world in particular, it was you know, fish. In fact, there's um, one of my favorite books on classical Athens is actually titled Fish Cakes and Courtesans. And it makes reference to the fact that fish was a big social um, indicator. You know, like you could show off by bringing this wonderful fish and whatever. So, you know, in this early community of Paul, there were people who would be thinking in the mindset of the social gathering, the social meal that they're used to. So they would be trying to show off, you know, bringing on the nice fish. But what happens when you're gathering at the table and it's not just your peers? What happens when you gather at the table and the laborers turn up or the enslaved people turn up or the women turn up? You know, you, you don't want them eating your good fish, drinking your good wine. You know, now, some of the, these people might turn up early so they can actually help themselves to this wonderful food and this wonderful drink because it's probably very different from what they're used to having. While you might say to your friends, you lot come early. We'll eat the good fish, the good food, and we'll have a well of a time. And then when the, the poor people turn up and there's nothing to eat, now that's their problem, not ours. You know, there's a whole bunch of bits and pieces floating in the background here. But what does seem to be a strong indication of what is supposed to be a sign of the kingdom of God has become once more a sign of disunity, a sign of division. That people are turning up, maybe they're a bit late, they've been working too hard or whatever, and there's nothing there for them to eat. And other people are, you know, you know, you know, imagine the scene. You turn up to take part in the communion and there's nothing there, the potluck, whatever you want to call it. And there's someone who's obviously had a lot of food, whatever. You know, what does that make you think about the kingdom of God? Like, you know, it's one thing for Jesus to say, we're all going to be fed. And yet here I am and I'm not being fed at this celebration of the kingdom of the Lord's Supper. So what does, you know, Paul do? Paul directly evokes the memory of Jesus in that first Lord's Supper. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you. And once I think what we have here is Paul reminding people 
I told you this. <laughs> it's like, and this is not new. So, you know, remember again, so I'll start. For what I received from the Lord, what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then Paul talks about some of the, the anecdotes he's heard of people are getting sick and all this kind of stuff. So what do we have is a reminder from Paul and Neil. These meals are not, you know, it seems that these were just, you know, potlucks, you know, like, you know, maybe it's kind of, you know, the one, the official communion that they have become, you know, these words of institution. But I think what Paul is trying to stress to the people, if you're going to lead to be part of a community, We're, we're doing this in Jesus' name. We need to be reminded of what Jesus himself said and did. What is supposed to happen when the community gathers around the table to break bread together. That the elements are bread and the, and the wine. You know, don't, you know, that's those are kind of the focal point. And we go from this kind of vision of communion into chapter 12, where Paul talks about the spiritual gift. And this is a wonderful chapter in that in many ways, what Paul is doing is he encapsulates the whole point of being part of the body of Christ. That everyone has contributions to offer. Now, in the world of Paul, in the world of Jesus, yes, the, the elites will tell you, yes, you need peasants. Someone's got to grow the food. Someone's got to make sure we don't starve. Someone's got to be exploited so we have a little bit of tax money to kind of buy ourselves some nice things. But they're not going to celebrate that. You know, that's just the natural order of things as far as they're concerned. That they, as leaders, because of their leading hard work, are entitled to exploit everyone else. That's kind of the, the contract, that to be a leader in the world of humanity in general, let's not kill ourselves, but to be a leader means too all too often that you feel you're, ex you're entitled to exploit everyone else because you're working so hard to be a good leader, quote unquote, that you're entitled to that little bit of privilege. You're entitled to that nice piece of meat those nice clothes, conquering another country. You know, the perks of being a leader. What Paul is stressed, and these are the issues that are happening in Corinth, that they are people who believe that they are entitled to the perks of being a leader, that they have gifts, gifts of prophecy, gifts of tongues, gifts of leadership in general. And some have risen to this idea, have embraced this idea in Karn that as spiritually superior to the other members of the congregation, they are entitled to be honored as better people. That they have these gifts given to them by God. And surely if God is giving me these gifts, I must be acknowledged as such. I need, you know, it would be nice if you put a statue of me or a in, in, the, in, the, in the front hall. And, you know, Chloe, Chloe and her people didn't like that. That's why they wrote to Paul. And Paul reminds the community, you're all essential. You're all important. You are all necessary. You're all being given gifts. So, yeah, the person who preaches, 
the person who heals, the person who prepares the food, the person who cleans the toilets. You're all essential for that community. You're all necessary for that community to flourish. And as far as God is concerned, you, everything is needed. And this idea of some feeling that they deserve more respect because their gifts are better than other people. Paul is saying, your gifts may be more flamboyant, more noticeable, may even bring in more people. But to say that they're more important than, say, the essential gift of cleaning the toilets. No, as far as God is concerned, that's not the case. All are necessary. You know, as you know, you know, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. This is chapter 12, verses 27 on. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts. And I will show you still a more excellent way. So, Paul is clear. Work. Do the best that you can. Strive to be a better follower of Jesus. But don't let it puff you up. Because then, as we'll now hear in chapter 13, if you do any of this stuff without love, you're wasting your time. Don't bother. Or as he puts it more fancily, you're a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Love. This comes to the very much of the heart of the matter in terms of divisions and leadership and, and, and such. The importance of loving God and knowing that you are loved by God as a way of doing what you can to serve God. If you don't love God, if you don't love one another, don't bother. Go and join your own club. Go and you know, set up the club of speaking in tongues for the peasants. You know, if you want people to share in the hope of the kingdom of God, the way you will live your life in relationship with God and with the people around you is how people will decide if they want to accept your invitation. That is what Paul is saying to the people of Corinth. Uh, throughout the letter, Paul challenges his audience to let go of their expectations that have led to division within the community. This is the problem that there are people within the community of Corinth who have expectations of leadership, expectations of power, expectations of authority, and have decided to live up to those expectations in a way that tramples on other people's struggles to be followers of Jesus. Now, some people are comfortable to hear that. They are those who have struggled and whatever. And so when someone comes along and says, I know the answers, I know what to do, follow me, there will be some who will say, yeah, thank you. I'm sick to death of this thinking business. But there will be others who will say, that's not what I signed up for. I signed up to be part of this kingdom of God. To restore unity, it is not merely a question of saying, let's stop fighting, let's sing Kumbaya, and let's all go on happily ever after. That does not work. To restore unity is a question of learning of what it means to be in relationship with one another and to be in relationship with people who do have different expectations and different understandings. Where have we struggled to share our understanding of who Jesus is for us? And what does it mean to share in his way of the kingdom of God? How do we live that out? And I, you know, as we will be discussing next week, just as critical an issue as it is for us today as it was in that community of Corinth. Because at the heart of the vision of the kingdom of God 
is a willingness to learn from God how to love one another, how to love ourselves, and how to love God. And that begins with learning how to talk to one another and to listen to one another. If we celebrate that we're all loved by God, then can that lead to an acknowledgement that we're capable of loving one another, even if we're quite different from one another, and even more important, if we're in tension with one another. So that's it, folks. Um, I, you know, if we want to have some time for questions, that's not a problem. Uh, you, know, we'll, you know, the main conversation obviously happens next week. But if you have some technical questions or some kind of quick observations, I think we have a little bit of time for folks to have that opportunity if that's what people would like to do. So let's go from there. And before we get into a bunch of questions, a process question, are you comfortable having the recording continue through these questions? Or I am, yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. I'll say something then. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I had to read you. Okay. Um, so what sort of questions are we going to just like, what is the nature of the questions regarding our congregation? Like what's, what's the angle we're taking on this? Well, as you know, like, from my understanding, what we're hoping to do next week is talk about how do we live in a divided world? Okay. Well, that's what I want to know. Like some, give me some like leading questions there. Okay. Well, like for example, how do we deal with the, you know, the divisions caused by COVID-19, you know, how, yeah. do we, how do we listen to people who have adhered to ways of understanding that to us make no sense? Like, you know, <laughs> how do we talk to an anti-vaxxer? Yeah. Um, th th those kind of divisions. Economic divisions, like how do we live in a world where we have such profound income inequality, it just boggles the mind that the Molotov cocktails haven't come out yet. <laughs> I probably shouldn't say that out loud. Um, but there are so many divisions within our society. You know, how do we, and how do we respond to the fact that many of those divisions are artificially created? That there are internet farms, as I think there was one term they used, of Russians who deliberately send out misinformation create division in our society and how do you explain to other people that you have been lied to uh, what you know what what are our tools for that conversation like you know you can't you know and I, I certainly know this for a fact you can't just say to someone the russians are lying to you <laughs> it's like because often people identify themselves with those divisions and that's one of the challenges we face. And, and I'll, go, I'll offer myself as an example. I grew up in a culture where there were profound religious divisions that people identified themselves with those divisions with no bloody clue what those divisions actually meant. I am a Protestant. Okay, explain to me justification for faith. I have no idea what you're talking about. But I'm a Protestant. Because core part of the theology and yet because your culture has created that division because your understanding created it. and so those are the kind of things we're going to be looking at like how do divisions yeah no i think that i would enjoy that kind of connections because we've got lots of lots to draw from in recent days yeah but also just the other question again pardon my ignorance on the whole bible stuff but if this is some kind of division time, how many years after Jesus's death was this? this like, what are we talking about here? Like, 20 years, 20, oh, 30 okay. years. Old. Like, we're not like hundreds or anything. We're like, this, oh, this no. Uh, like, already this, these people were sort of dividing or whatever. Okay. The, 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 and this, I'll keep this short. Well, I'll try to because it's a huge topic. But one of the things that we are now, we're now beginning to realize through uh, biblical scholarship and, and gospel scholarship is the division of, there were so many profound divisions of how people understood who Jesus was. That um, 
there were many who at that time did not believe in the relevance of the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. There were many Christians who said that it's the teachings that are relevant. The crucifixion is not so relevant. There are others who the crucifixion was the be all and end all. What the gospels do is they bring many of the strands together with the focal point still being the crucifixion, but even then they represent the divisions within the early Christian community. The Gospel of Matthew represents the Jewish Christian tradition. The Luke tradition is more closer to the Gentiles. And I would suggest that the, the Gospel of John represents more the Gnostics. So you already have these divisions. So, but these divisions, because it is believed that one of the things that was going on is that there were people who were joining in these early Christian communities who were looking for a way of importance within their community at large. Mm -hmm. And as, uh, as the Christian communities were new and emerging, some did see this as a position, particularly women, interestingly enough, that women saw themselves as a, in being able to have a position of power, a position of authority that they didn't have elsewhere in the world. And so, you know, that's, you know, division is quick. Uh, and Paul himself, Paul is one of the critical voices that leads to a profound division within the Christian community. It is thanks to Paul that Christianity pivots towards the Gentiles and the Romans. He represents a fundamental kind of division between uh, those Christians who very much saw themselves as part of the Jewish tradition represented by uh, Jesus' brother, and it is Paul who takes it in a completely different direction. Uh, and so, you know, divisions there from the it's it's there from the very beginning because part of the problem is people. <laughs> you know, that uh, um, when Moses talked about God and this, you know, when God and Moses talked about stiff-necked people, you know, you know, that's part of the deal. You know, people will argue. How do you? And, and I think one of the questions that we will hopefully explore is. How do you accept that division is a reality in such a way that it won't tear you apart? And it's not just a question of we'll agree to disagree. That doesn't really work either. It's more a question of acknowledging those divisions, listening to those divisions, maybe understanding that they come from somewhere that makes sense. It might not be healthy, but it makes sense. And if it makes sense, then maybe we can find a way to kind of bridge that gap. Oh, okay. So dealing with human nature and people are people then and now, I guess is what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Good. 